After the flawless success of Starship's 11th flight, SpaceX has wasted no time shifting focus toward Flight 12, the mission that will debut the first next-generation Block 3 Starship vehicles. Work on the new ship and booster is already in full swing, while major upgrades are underway at Pad 1, where SpaceX is dismantling and rebuilding large portions of the launch infrastructure. But as SpaceX accelerates development, tensions with NASA are also escalating, with the agency's leadership beginning to question whether Starship can still fulfill its critical role in the Artemis lunar program. Let's discuss each one of these developments one by one. Flight 11 marked a decisive turning point in Starship's development. For the first time, SpaceX achieved every primary mission objective without a single in-flight anomaly. Both stages performed nominally, completed all milestones, and executed soft splashdowns in the ocean as planned. With that milestone achieved, SpaceX has now shifted its full attention to the more advanced Block 3 generation, a design aimed at true reusability, on-orbit propellant transfer, and rapid turnaround between flights. The first of these vehicles, Ship 39, is rapidly taking shape inside Mega Bay 2. Its nose cone and payload base section have already been joined with the forward dome, marking steady progress toward full stacking. Once the remaining tank sections are integrated, teams will begin outfitting internal systems, routing hydraulic, pneumatic, electrical, and avionics lines before preparing the vehicle for cryogenic proof testing. At the same time, Booster 18 is advancing inside Mega Bay 1. The liquid oxygen tank is complete, and stacking of the methane tank is now in progress. Block 3 introduces numerous structural and performance upgrades over Block 2, reflecting lessons learned from previous flights. Key improvements include new plumbing for in-orbit propellant transfer, redesigned ship catch fittings, an upgraded propellant transfer tube within the booster, and a fully integrated hot stage ring that eliminates the need for a separate interstage section. The forward dome has been reinforced to handle higher pressurization loads, and the booster features newly optimized grid fins for better aerodynamic control during descent. Most notably, both stages will be powered by the Raptor 3 engine, a next-generation design delivering higher thrust, improved efficiency, and superior reliability. I've covered each of these upgrades separately in detail in my previous videos. You can find the links to those in the description below. While assembly of the next-generation hardware continues, SpaceX is also tearing down and rebuilding its Pad 1 launch complex to meet Block 3's new requirements. SpaceX plans to demolish the existing orbital launch mount and replace it with a redesigned structure featuring a flame trench, mirroring the setup now implemented at Pad 2. Preparatory work for dismantling the launch mount began almost immediately after Flight 11. Teams purged all propellant lines with liquid nitrogen to safely eliminate any residual methane or oxygen, a standard safety step before hot work on cryogenic systems. Meanwhile, the launch tower arms are undergoing major modifications. SpaceX plans to shorten the massive chopstick arms to match Pad 2's upgraded design. The reduced length lowers bending moments and dynamic loads, making the arms stiffer, more stable, and less prone to oscillation. Shorter arms also improve control during lifting and mid-air catch operations, flexing less, responding faster, and reducing structural fatigue over repeated cycles. To prepare for these modifications, engineers have already removed key systems, including the hydraulic shock absorbers that cushion booster catches, the centering screw mechanism that aligns the booster on the rails, and the ship lifting pins that secure the vehicle before hoisting. Welded lifting lugs have also been installed on the arms as crane anchor points, indicating that the trimming process is imminent. Once these upgrades are complete, the arms should enable smoother mid-air catches and quicker repositioning between stacking operations. Ground systems at Pad 1 are being stripped down as well. The berm wall separating the tank farm from the launch area is being demolished to give crews better access to buried pipelines and aging hardware that will be replaced. Existing pumps, heat exchangers, and propellant transfer lines are expected to be relocated, as their current positions lie directly in the path of the new flame trench and the booster exhaust flow that the trench will divert during launches. Only the large cryogenic storage tanks are expected to remain in place. The water-cooled steel plate system beneath the launch mount will also be taken out, while the deluge water tanks are being redesigned to provide greater capacity and higher discharge pressure. These upgrades are intended to meet the new flame diverter's requirements, which must withstand the significantly higher acoustic and thermal loads expected from Block 3 launches.
While SpaceX races ahead on the engineering front, its relationship with NASA has become tense. Acting NASA Administrator Sean Duffy recently criticized SpaceX for falling behind on Starship's lunar development program. SpaceX secured a $2.9 billion contract from NASA in April 2021 to develop and adapt its Starship rocket as the human landing system, intended as the crewed lunar lander for Artemis III, NASA's mission to return humans to the moon. Since then, SpaceX has built HLS mock-ups to evaluate interior layouts, including crew quarters and storage, and to support astronaut training, such as testing ingress and egress procedures. In parallel, SpaceX has completed lab tests on the docking adapters, validating the mechanisms that will allow Starship to dock with Orion in lunar orbit for astronaut transfer. Looking ahead, SpaceX plans in-space refueling demonstrations in 2026, a critical step for refueling the Artemis lunar lander before its journey to the moon. Despite these advancements, Duffy expressed concerns over delays and technical challenges, casting doubt on a 2027 landing. Now, SpaceX had the contract for Artemis 3. The problem is they're behind. They pushed their timelines out and we're in a race against China. The president and I want to get to the moon in this uh, president's term. NASA plans to reopen the lunar lander contract, inviting other companies to compete. Duffy stressed that NASA cannot base its lunar return strategy on a single company, regardless of technological capability, citing Blue Origin's Blue Moon Lander, already contracted for Artemis V, as a potential alternative. The move reflects mounting political pressure to ensure the U.S. lands astronauts on the moon before China. So I'm going to open up uh, the, the contract. I'm going to let other, uh, other uh, space companies compete with SpaceX, like, l l like Blue Origin. Um, and again, whatever one can get us there first um, to the moon, we're going to take. And if SpaceX is behind, okay. but Blue Origin can do it before them, good on Blue Origin. But uh, we, by the way, we also might have two companies that can get, that can get us back to the moon um, uh, in 2028. But again, okay. we're not going to wait for one company. We're going to push this forward and win the second space race against the Chinese, get back to the moon, set up a camp, a base. And from there, it's gonna, we're going to figure out how we can actually get to Mars. Ars Technica reports that Duffy has explored moving NASA under the Department of Transportation, which could allow him to maintain agency oversight and influence leadership appointments. While this might streamline decision-making, it also raises concerns about added bureaucracy and potential disruption to ongoing programs, including Artemis. Jared Isaacman, billionaire entrepreneur, pilot, and commercial astronaut, was under consideration for the NASA administrator position earlier this year. His nomination reportedly had strong backing due to his deep involvement in commercial spaceflight and close ties with SpaceX. However, the White House quietly withdrew his candidacy before it was made official. Soon after, Transportation Secretary Sean Duffy emerged as the leading figure overseeing NASA policy, effectively taking charge of space matters and reshaping the agency's direction, sidelining Isaacman's potential appointment in the process. Following Duffy's recent criticism of SpaceX, Elon Musk reaffirmed his support for Isaacman as the rightful choice to lead NASA, praising his direct experience with commercial missions and understanding of spaceflight realities. Musk also lashed out at Duffy, accusing him of undermining NASA's goals, calling him Sean dangerously stupid dummy, and quipping that the person responsible for America's space program can't have a two-digit IQ. He defended SpaceX's progress, noting that Starship is advancing at an unprecedented pace and questioned Blue Origin's readiness, citing its lack of orbital experience. Musk further referenced Grok AI analysis showing that NASA's Artemis II crewed lunar flyby, scheduled for February next year, will cost over $4 billion, with total program costs exceeding $40 billion, while a fully reusable Starship mission could achieve similar objectives for under $1 billion. Experts inside and outside NASA have also testified that Starship may struggle to meet Artemis schedules, citing the number of launches required for in-orbit refueling, time to human rate the lander, and uncertainty over timely astronaut delivery. The architecture is as such. We need to launch Starship. That first Starship is a fueling depot that's in orbit around the Earth. Then we need to launch, nobody really knows, nobody knows, but it could be up to dozens of additional Starships to refuel the first Starship. So imagine launching Starship over and 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 over, dozens of times, no delays, no explosions, to refuel the first Starship. Then once it's fully refueled, then that Starship has to fuel another Starship that is in fact human-rated, which that process hasn't even started yet. 
By the way, that whole in-space refueling thing has never been tested either. We're talking about cryogenic liquid oxygen, cryogenic liquid methane being transferred in space, never been done before, and we're gonna do it dozens of times, and then we're gonna have a human-rated starship that is refueled that goes all the way to the moon. Now, when it goes to the moon, we don't know how long it can be there because it's boiling off the entire time it's in orbit around the moon. We don't know how long it can be there, but while it's there, we have to launch the SLS, we have to launch the Orion, the European service module, we have to have astronauts and crew all ready to go. And they have to, they have to orbit the moon themselves in that window, that window when Starship is around the moon, and then they have to dock around the moon, they have to transfer from the Orion into the Starship, it has to go down and land. When it's on the surface of the moon, Starship is gone, or uh, Orion is gone for the next seven days until it comes back around in near rectilinear halo orbit. So our astronauts are right now planning to be on the surface of the moon for a period of seven days without any way home. This is an architecture that no NASA administrator that I'm aware of would have selected had they had the choice. But it was a decision that was made in the absence of a NASA administrator in the last administration. Musk dismissed these doubts, explaining that Starship to Starship refueling is far simpler than docking with the ISS, since the same vehicle design connects to itself rather than two different spacecraft. This approach avoids many alignment and interface issues, making the operation easier. He added that the challenge is well within SpaceX's capabilities and will be repeatedly demonstrated with Block 3 vehicles next year. In my opinion, it's important to put these concerns in perspective. NASA's space launch system took more than a decade to reach its first flight in 2022, despite relying on proven shuttle-era technology. Starship, built from scratch with entirely new systems like stainless steel structures and Raptor engines, has advanced at a far faster pace. Critics often ignore that contrast when questioning SpaceX's schedule. Even so, Duffy's decision to reopen the lunar lander contract marks a pivotal moment, one that adds pressure and competition, but also gives SpaceX a chance to prove Starship's readiness both technically and programmatically. The outcome could reshape Artemis timelines and NASA's broader lunar strategy. What are your thoughts on NASA reopening the lunar lander competition, and can Starship realistically meet its ambitious timeline? Share your views in the comments below. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. SpaceX recently achieved an extraordinary trifecta of records in a single week, setting a new booster reuse milestone, surpassing 10,000 Starlink satellites in orbit, and matching last year's Falcon 9 launch total with over two months remaining in 2025. Let's unravel them one by one. The sequence began on October 19th, when a Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station for the Starlink Group 10-17 mission. This flight set the record for booster reuse, marking the 31st launch and landing of a single Falcon 9 first stage, B-1067, one of the fleet's most veteran vehicles. The booster debuted in June 2021 during the CRS-22 resupply mission to the International Space Station and has since become a symbol of the company's reusability revolution. On this 31st flight, the booster helped send 22 second-generation Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit. The upper stage deployed the payloads to an altitude of about 279 kilometers, inclined 53 degrees to the equator. Barely two hours later, another Falcon 9 roared to life, this time from Space Launch Complex 4E at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. That launch, designated Starlink Group 1119, carried 28 additional satellites into a near-polar orbit inclined at 70 degrees, reaching an operational altitude of roughly 530 kilometers. These high-inclination missions extend Starlink's broadband coverage to higher latitudes, including polar and remote regions where traditional ground networks are impractical. With the Vandenberg mission's success, SpaceX crossed a monumental threshold, surpassing 10,000 Starlink satellites launched since the program began in 2019. In total, 10,006 satellites have now been deployed across 319 launches. Of these, roughly 8,680 remain in orbit, and around 7,455 are currently operational, forming the largest functioning satellite constellation ever built. Each Starlink satellite is engineered for an average lifespan of about five years, after which it performs a controlled deorbit using onboard ion thrusters, ensuring safe re-entry and atmospheric disintegration to minimize orbital debris. That same Vandenberg launch also marked the 132nd Falcon 9 mission of 2025, matching the record set in 2024. 
With roughly 10 weeks left in the year, SpaceX is on pace to exceed 150 orbital launches by December, an unprecedented annual cadence for any launch vehicle in history. Since its maiden flight in June 2010, Falcon 9 has completed 546 successful missions out of 549 attempts, achieving 99.5% reliability, an unmatched record in modern rocketry. In under two decades, Falcon 9 has evolved from an experimental vehicle into the backbone of global space access, demonstrating the real-world benefits of routine reusability. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.